Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are again at the President's College of the University of Hartford, and we have two distinguished guests tonight, one being Joe Volker. Joe, you're always a distinguished guest. You're, you, do, you do such a wonderful job. You're here every time. Thank you, Bob. My attendance has been good. Yes, it's been an A+. Plus. And David Simon, you are our special guest tonight. How are you, David? I'm just fine. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. Okay, Joe, you're on. You've got 15 minutes to talk about what's happening at the President's College. And I will do my best, Bob, to cram it all in, and I won't get all of it. Um, I want to start with the recent past, because last Saturday we had our annual uh, President's College Symposium on the Arts. Um, well, the annual symposium, which this year was on the arts, and we had 22 of the most prominent leaders of arts organizations in Hartford and the Hartford region gather for an entire day to talk about the future of the arts in Hartford and what we can do underneath uh, current budget constraints. Uh, we talked about the future of, of the arts for a coming generation who are of course the millennials and the lovers of technology. Uh, and we talked about theater, art, music, uh, you name it. And um, I want to thank everyone who helped put on this wonderful symposium and mm -hmm. to say that I hope that somehow or other we'll be able to continue this conversation in future years. That this, this is, is not a very unique program, is it not, here for the Central Connecticut area? This particular group in, in this particular dimensions has never gotten together before and they have lots and lots to share about their organizations and how they can hope to survive and thrive in the future. Yeah. And um, it we're sure delighted. challenge. Thank you. We're delighted that the uh, President's College and the University of Hartford are central to this conversation. And um, I hope that in some form we could do it again. Okay. So um, I also wanted to make an announcement because it's a footnote, it's a technicality, but we should say it. The President's College no longer writes a monthly newsletter. We have gotten such good response um, with our constituencies electronically that everybody now goes to the website, knows how to do it, enjoys doing it, and so we are acting just like any college would now. We have a fall and a winter catalog which stays up on the website, but we're not mailing every month the upcoming classes, and I want our friends to know that because it's, uh, it's important to, to go visit us again um, on the website now. That saves a great deal of money in postage. Okay. Now, does that reflect anything here on our sign? Nope. There's the website and there's the email address and both of those are operating and our, our operators are still standing by, Bob. Okay. <laughs> so it's pcollege at hartford-edu and hartford edu slash president's college the first one is our email address the yes. second is our website good okay Great. everybody got that yay <laughs> um, and let me talk now about things that are going on upcoming um, right now at the president's college uh, it's an exciting uh, season for us um, humphrey tonkin the former director of the president's college has put together an extravaganza of a class it's going to last an entire year on the history of the 16th century in England. Um, and it will begin um, in October, and it will, uh, October the 6th, in fact. Is that right? No, it starts uh, this week 
which is the 20, the, uh, tomorrow actually, Tuesday, okay. which is what, the 29th or something. Okay, so it's a, it's a week earlier than I thought. It yep. will have um, each class of 10 classes lasting through the fall and then the spring yes. um, will be dedicated to a, a subsequent decade of the 16th century. Um, and it's going to be um, some pretty wonderful things. Uh, this, this semester, of course, we will see the royal divorce and the uh, death of St. Thomas More um, and the um, hegemony of Henry VIII. And then uh, when he goes on into next spring semester, we will have the heyday of William Shakespeare, the Spanish Armada, and really the realization of England in its journey from an island to an empire. Under Elizabeth I. Under Elizabeth I. Right. And, okay. and that course already has about 100 students um, right. enrolled in it. So I'm one of them. And you are one of them. That's <laughs> right. what you were telling me. Yep. Good for you for getting a seat. Um, I want to mention Jennifer DeCola Matos' class. She's going to do um, a history of the modern era, mid-20th century, of West Hartford. Its business models, um, its zoning, uh, and the way in which West Hartford became the very successful magnet suburb that it did and what the secret of that might be. And that involves a walking and bus tour as well. So it's a chance for people to come learn about their own backyard. Hmm. Something that, uh, you know, micro history, local history is sometimes hard to find and they're going to do a great job of that. Um, I've mentioned before on the show, but it's always worth uh, repeating that Gilda Aliota will reprise her Supreme Court course. And this year, she's going to look at the major issues that were before the court last year. Um, affirmative action, contraception, religious freedom, presidential power, immigration, and on and on. It was of 2015 was a big year for the Supreme Court. And uh, she will be talking about the implications of those decisions as we move forward in history. Jilda, as you know, is a tremendously popular and effective teacher, and people really enjoy coming back to her classes year after year. Will she give us a clue <laughs> as to <laughs> at the obvious questions? Yeah. I don't think Jilda actually has magical powers, <laughs> but she's a fine scholar. Okay, looking forward to it. Um, and of course, one of our real celebrities, Patrick McCacky, is about to start a class. This will begin, and I know this is right, on October 21st. Patrick was the uh, director of the Yale Center for British Art and, of course, our own uh, Athenaeum, Wadsworth Athenaeum, and he's going to do a class on Americans' self-perception in the light of Europe and the great European tradition and the ways in which um, they perceive themselves. And it's really a narrative, um, starting with John Singer Sargent and ending with Frank Stella. Uh, and the story is that with each generation, really American artists cared a little less about Europe. They, they felt less in the shadow of it. Um, he will also uh, be talking about Edward Hopper, Jackson Pollock, and Willem de Kooning. Okay. So that should, be, um, that should be a really fun class. He, too, tends to have rather large enrollments. Um, and we've got some up, upcoming classes that I want to at least briefly mention, because maybe we will um, urge people or persuade people to go to the website and learn more about these. Um, First, Sami Aziz, who is the Muslim chaplain at Wesleyan University. Hey, Wesleyan! <laughs> I hear the voice of an alum. Yes. And he will be talking um, about understanding Islam, something that we could all certainly do a better job of. I've met Sami, and he is a delightful man. And I think that that course will be um, of great use to us um, in learning about um, other cultures. And Frank Rizzo, who was a New York Times yes. and, and local um, reporter on the arts, is going to reprise his course on the musical Hamilton. Hmm. The course has filled. There are people asking, can he do it again, please? <laughs> and what they often say is, I can't get to the show. I can't get tickets. Could I at least hear what Frank has to say about it? So that's coming up. And I'm even already talking to Frank about maybe doing it in the spring if this one crowds people out yet again. Well, I've read the book. The biography. The biography, yeah. Uh, Do you uh, recommend it? Uh, highly recommend it. It was absolutely thrilling. It really, I mean, I read it a couple of years ago, and I'll never forget going down to New York to the um, Historical Society on Central Park West. They had a whole display and a whole exhibit on Alexander Hamilton. 
and here's a person a personage you don't really think about when you think about the Revolutionary War, but how critical he was, you know, to the to the bringing together of the United States of America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, that biography was the uh, the, the foundation of the musical. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, we always like to do something for right, the sure now. Right. Exactly. Right. We right. always like to do a little something for the the scientists and engineers in our gang. And so we're having Ted Sussman, who's an engineering professor at the university, talk about the history of America's infrastructure, from the railroads to the Eisenhower years of the highways on into what will now be self-driving cars and smart traffic control and all those things. So he really loves this topic and has thoughts about how roads should go through Hartford as well. Um, so that should be fun for those who like to know how things work. Mm. Um, this is a big one of the Juilliard String Quartet is going to visit the President's College and exclusively the President's College and they're going to take an afternoon and demonstrate how their emotional interdynamics provide a passionate performance of a string quartet. And then when is this going to be presented? Th that will be on November the 10th. One day? One day that afternoon. Okay. They're visiting, as, as you know, the University of Hartford used to have an in-residence quartet. Yes. And now we've moved to the Garmony series, which uh, includes various instrumentations and combinations. And this is a one-time visit when the Juilliard comes. So um, it's an opportunity not to be missed. Okay. Uh, another big event that I want to take a moment with, um, we have teamed up with the Charter Oaks chapter of the Military Officers Association, and we are putting on a one-day conference with lunch going pretty much all day on sat Saturday, October the 22nd. It will be in Wild Auditorium and um, it will concern uh, military hotspots and places where national defense is at stake in the current political global climate. Um, we're having faculty from uh, the Naval War College, the Army War College, and the Heritage Foundation mm. to lecture on, I'll give you the flavor of this by giving you some of the topics, uh, Putin's foreign policy and Russian expansion, NATO and Russia after the 2016 Warsaw Summit, the evolution of Islamic militancy, a global approach to combating ISIS, and Red Star over the Pacific Chinese expansionism. Wow. I actually start to shudder as I... I was going to say, it's nice that you have something light <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. in your program. This well, will be a very serious day. And so, just to repeat, that's October the 22nd. Um, the cost is only $40 and includes lunch. Wow. So there's probably a lot more ways to, more expensive ways to spend a Saturday <laughs> spend day, right. than learning everything that yeah. is here, and which I would like to know a great deal more. I know a presidential candidate who want to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sending an invitation. <laughs> um, and that sums up, I, I don't want to forget to mention that both at Duncaster and at Macaulay, we have a wonderful series of lectures, which you can find out all about by going to that website um, that run through the fall season as well. Good. And now, with the time remaining, I am absolutely delighted um, to introduce my friend David Simon, who is a professor at, re retired professor at Colby College. Um, an art historian of considerable note. Um, and you might want to say something about this, David, but you're also the artist of uh, Jansen's History of Art. You're the, the author of Jansen's History of Art. Oh, the, the later edition. Jansen was the author of his own editions originally. But the fact that that very, very, that, that book is on the shelves of just about every educated American. I, I know, it's, uh, it's, it's daunting, actually. <laughs> Can but you I, tell us the specifics of what you would find in that Jansen's book. Well, Jansen's, Jansen's book, it's now usually, it, it's sold in one volume, but it's also sold in two volumes because yes. it, it's so extensive. But it runs from the caves through contemporary art. I'm responsible for the chapters, uh, medieval chapters, the chapters on the Middle Ages, really? from early Christianity in the fourth century through the Gothic cathedral in the um, 13th century. So I'm responsible for half of one of the volumes. And David Wonderful. is here with us today because he's about to give a course on medieval monasteries, art and culture. Um, and I think with no further framing, I'll just ask you, what are you going to do? Well, it's, um, it, it, uh, a course 
that will try to look at the monastery as a cultural phenomenon. Um, religious is part of the cultural experience, but, but cultural um, in its own right, and um, how it relates to art and architecture of the Middle Ages. Mm. Um, bec it, much of the, or many of the greatest works that survive from the Middle Ages are in fact monastic works. Right. Uh, churches, uh, the, the architecture of, of buildings, the sculpture that decorated them, um, the manuscripts that were produced by them, and the metalwork and uh, objects that were produced, mm. reliquaries, crosses, uh, various mm. uh, works. And so the, so the monastery is a way, in fact, of looking at medieval, medieval art and medieval culture in Can general. we talk about the Gothic churches? Do you plan to cover that? Uh, uh, area? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Gothic a little bit, but Gothic churches, that's really the transition away from when monastic was most important, which is in the period before Gothic art, the Romanesque period. Because what happens with Gothic is the Gothic becomes a more urban art, mm -hmm. and it's a city art. The, when, you think of, when we think of Gothic today, you think of Paris, Rennes, Chartres, and those are all cities as opposed to the monasteries where the culture mm. was to get away from civilization, to live a, an ascetic life, um, a life of prayer and of, of quietude, and so you get away from cities. So in fact, by the time Gothic comes mm. along, the monasteries aren't the same powerful determining force that they'd been in the previous period. Okay, so now where did, if I, uh, concentrate a little bit on Gothic. Where did the whole Gothic um, uh, methodology uh, originate? Well, the whole, in fact, much in terms of the meaning of Gothic cathedrals, much of it comes out of monastic thought. So it does derive from, uh, from that way of thinking. But my own take on it is a lot of it has to do with the, a new urban class that develops in, um, in Europe in the 12th and 13th century. There are a lot of things that happen in the 12th century in particular, but continuing to the 13th century, which include a new economy. Money starts, be money before this period had been very localized. But now there are people trading, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of um, cross-European interest results in an amalgamation of, th of various thoughts and various um, physical forms that lead to Gothic. Huh. Now, specifically, what will you be covering in your uh, program? Well, I'm going to start with the history of mon monasticism, Christ Christian monasticism, because actually the idea of monasticism is universal. We talk about Tibetan monks today or Buddhist monks, mm -hmm. and so you have, um, uh, there, there are lots of groups that do what, um, what, what Christian um, monks living in monasteries do. They retire from life, from an external life, terrestrial life, in order to um, get closer to a spiritual self and a spiritual uh, existence. Um, the, I'm going to begin with the Egyptian very quickly, we, because we don't have any physical survivals of it. And I'm, as an art historian, I'm interested in objects, mm -hmm. um, things. Uh, but um, the first evidence we have of people um, who are trying to separate themselves from the physical world are in the, probably in Egypt in the third century. Um, and those people live as hermits. They separate themselves from life and dedicate themselves largely to prayer. They deny themselves the richness of earthly life. So they live simple lives. Monks traditionally in the Middle Ages didn't eat meat, for example, as a way of denying themselves. Um, and, um, but that begins earlier, and the sort of desert in Egypt, these desert um, monks, but it's probably the, by the third century, there are a number of them. And then they started sort of grouping together, it would seem. And by the fifth century, we have monks l living together in a community. And um, a, a, an Egyptian um, monk, um, St. Pacomius, um, writes, in fact, rules. It's the first evidence we have of rules that are written for how monks should live. Hmm. And I'm interested in part in the sense of the rules, because it seems to me that what the rules do is they bring a kind of orderly disposition 
mm-hmm. of every of your daily life. It's not it's not an accident that we call the um, monastic tradi- the, the the tradition of people living monastic life is living in monastic orders mm-hmm. because of this orderliness. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and that develops in uh, in Egypt with these these rules by the probably under the influence of this Egyptian way of of organizing themselves. By the sixth century, mo- uh, monks in the West are starting to form themselves. Um, the the great example is Saint Benedict, um, who established a monastery. Uh, who first lived as a kind of hermit, but he became so influential, the people gathered around him, and there were enough of them, in fact, that he established 12 monasteries, each of which had 12 monks in it. Now, that number 12 is not accidental. They, are all, they, they see themselves as living a life that was defined by Christ himself, Christ and his 12 disciples. Are you talking about the monasteries throughout Europe? That's where they started. This is where, where yeah. they started. Yeah. They became we, we get mo- monasteries with hundreds of people in it later. Yes. But the original monasteries often had 12, uh, 12 mm-hmm. members. Because of the uh, 12 apostles? 12, 12 apostles. Mm-hmm. Yes. And in fact, they cite themselves um, in the Gospel of St. Mark, Christ says, um, those who come after me deny themselves, that is, live ascetic lives, but they should follow, m- follow me, that is, live the way he lived. Yeah. Um, and... Um, so they, th- that attempt to live with these uh, 12 months. And St. Ben- Benedict wrote rules which are still used in Benedictine monasteries mm. today. Mm. Uh, they're, they're short, simple, um, very com- lot, <laughs> it's common sense, guides a lot of them. Um, so uh, one, one of the things is that, um, that according to St. Benedict, is monks should have their own beds. Well, in a male community, yes, it's not a, oh, it's not a, it's sensible. Yeah. Uh, um, so, David, I think I was at the Charter House of Parma when I got the notion of that 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 monasteries were in a way a seed for so many things like medicine, alcohol, food. Um, right preservation of learning. And they were universities, they were your state store, they were so many things. Right. During, during the so-called Dark Ages, a period of barbarian invasions of Europe, when learning was diminished, um, whether it's dark or not, it's a question, but, but it was certainly diminished. And culture as we, we know it was, um, was simplified. Um, it was, in fact, in the Irish monasteries, off the, not, not in Europe itself, off the coast, where a lot of learning was preserved. And the Irish monks, um, in their attempt to missionize and Christianize Europe, brought that learning back to mm-hmm. the continent. Mm-hmm. So there is an argument that is made, I, I think it's stretched, but an argument is made how uh, the Irish monks saved civilization, huh. or Western civilization, mm-hmm. right. as, uh, as we know it. So I think you're exactly right. Now let's uh, talk about the, uh, art and how that plays into this whole monastic life. Well, w- w- the, the monks themselves, um, and there were various levels of, uh, of monks, but the monks themselves dedicated themselves to two, um, two broad enterprises. One was prayer, which they prayed. It varied from monastery to monastery, but usually seven times a day, inclu- or eight, including the middle of the night. Um, and uh, they would get up and pray and then go back to sleep. I think they were sort of miraculous. Mm-hmm. They could go back to sleep. I can never go back to sleep. <laughs> but, uh, but they would get up and pray and go back. And they, at various times of the day, they would pray. And the other was labor, manual labor. Yeah. And um, so it's under the manual labor that uh, agriculture developed tremendously in the Middle Ages because of what they learned. In, but one of the manual labors was pr- production of manuscripts. So we have books that we only know that survived from antiquity or were copied from antique classical books because of mon- monasteries where what they do is copy books. Now let's talk about specifically what are you going to cover in your, how many, how many sessions? Four are, sessions, four, four classes. classes. What specifically are you going to cover so that viewers might be interested in attending? Yeah. Well, it's not, the um, monuments I'm going to cover 
Aunt, uh, I taught a, a course on Gothic Cathedral a year or so ago. And in that, those are, those are the great monuments. Notre Dame in Paris, Chartres. I mean, those are the monuments everybody knows and everybody who's traveled, um, traveled abroad has visited. But um, the Romanesque monuments, which will largely define the, uh, the course, are much less well known, largely because they're, they're outside of the urban areas mm -hmm. and they're in the country. But they are incredibly beautiful. And so some of them are very important. The monastery, the Burgundian monastery um, in eastern France of Cluny, for example, uh, mm -hmm. we'll study. We will study the sort of first Gothic building the Abbey of Saint Denis, in front, uh, out, just outside, um, mm -hmm. just outside Paris. Um, we will uh, talk about some monasteries, um, Irish monasteries. Of uh, I was just in Ireland this summer looking at monasteries, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about some of the, those early monasteries, which date from the eighth uh, eighth century, uh, and a very simple rustic affairs, but uh, very very beautifully situated. We'll talk about uh, one of my favorites in northern Spain in the Pyrenees, the monastery of um, um, San Juan de la Pena, that is St. John of the Cliff. And it's built underneath a cliff, so the natural rock face serves as oh. the covering for, for the monastery. Is there, is there a monastery tied in with Santiago, Santiago de Compostela? Yes, yes. There are monasteries all along the way. One all the along the route, route from the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And one of the theories of the um, Camino de Santiago, the route to yeah. St. James, is that monasteries were developed along the way so that pilgrims could stop, right. spend the night. Now, it, part of it was out, one, one of the rules of St. Benedict is that the monasteries have to take in pilgrims, holy people who are making a holy journey. But it also brought um, income into the monastery. Mm. And that's tourists. One, tourists, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you, you, you know, you're a the tourist. Early where, tourists. Where you, sure. where you want is a good place to stay, where you know they'll treat you, treat mm -hmm. you well. They won't take advantage of you. You won't be uh, <laughs> a B and B. Right, exactly. And the monastery served that function. But one of the things that interests me is I've used this word order, the order, but the orderliness of the arrangement of the monastery is just um, for me electrifying in how much it represents the thought process of the monk. So that the arrangement of the church, the door, daughter, that is the place where the monks slept, the place where the, the refectory where the monks ate, the cloister that the monks walked around, and, uh, and the arrangement one to the other is so well thought out. Each one is as if it's an ideal community. So well, that, I, that's this, this stuff really turns me on. I don't know <laughs> if it turns you on, Joe. Are you thinking of becoming a monk? I th well, yeah. My, yeah there's I, something quite attractive. When I get older, you know. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. This has really been quite a, uh, a, 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 a discussion about topic which we really rarely talk about, which is the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, because they weren't so dark, no, 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 actually no. not. No, no. And I'm looking forward, uh, possibly, to taking this course. Joe, when does the course begin? It begins uh, Thursday, October 6th. October, October the 6th. October 6th, and it's four sessions. Four, four sessions. Okay, four and uh, there's still room to sign up, I would assume. A few seats left. I understand okay. there may be six or seven seats left at really? this point. Really? No kidding. Well, I thank you very much, David. Thank you, it's thank you. just I've been delightful myself. talking with you about, uh, you know, an issue which we never talk about, you know. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And operators are waiting to, to, to answer your phones if you're interested in David's course which will start in the beginning of October. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. And David and uh, Joe and all you out there in TV land, good night. <laughs> <laughs>